Well, good morning, Life Church. I'm glad to see you this morning. I'm glad you're with us. Um, a few of you um, would have been here at 915 today and you came to this gathering because we asked you to. Um, and I just want to say thank you. The 915 service was covered up today. We were pretty much standing room only. And so I'm glad to those of you who adjusted your schedules to be with us this later hour. Um, we've had the, the practice run. Now here's the real thing for you anyway. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2 this morning. If you have a Bible with you, I hope you do. I'd love it if you'd turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18 on this Resurrection Sunday. If we don't know one another, my name is James Sharp. I'm one of the elders here. It's my joy to be with you this morning. Um, my youngest son, who is 11, um, told my wife this week, he said, um, I really like worshiping with the church on Resurrection Sunday. And she asked him, well, why is that? Why do you like worshiping with the church on Resurrection Sunday? And he said, well, the songs are always longer and the sermon's always shorter. <laughs> I just want you to know that I have an appointment tomorrow to write him out of my will. And so that's like nine whole dollars that he's not going to get when they lay me in the grave. <laughs> but anyway, there are some Resurrection Sunday mornings uh, when my heart is so full of joyful enthusiasm over the message that I get to share that I feel a little bit like a confetti cannon when I stand up here because I'm just, just ready to burst in light of the good news of what the resurrection of Jesus means for us. Um, I have to confess that this year I have approached today with really a, a very different set of thoughts and feelings and most of that just owes to the events of the last week in our community. We all want to believe in a fair order of existence, right? To believe that life will just play out in a predictable and plain way, to believe that we'll go from the cradle to the grave, from the alpha to the omega. We like to think that we will crawl and then walk and then run. That we'll graduate from high school, and then college, and then marry. It's reassuring to us to think that we'll find a career, have children, dance at our daughter's wedding, and then retire to a slower pace, leaving the world at a ripe old age with children and grandchildren behind us. And yes, we expect that we will experience peaks and valleys along the way. Sure, tomorrow is always uncertain, but we like to believe that there is order to the cosmos, or at least to the days of our lives. But then the 10-year-old is diagnosed with terminal cancer, or our country's best and brightest steps on a landmine in the Middle East somewhere, or the 17-year-old high school junior wraps his car around a tree at midnight on a Friday. Many in our community are grieving just that last reality this week, and among other things, that grief reminds us that life, the order of life, it's a mirage, a myth, right? There are no guarantees. As the book of James says, life is a vapor, a mist that appears for a little while, and then it's gone, it vanishes. And the truth is that we have no real way of knowing how long that mist will appear. We have no way of knowing how long before it's gone. That's why the truths of Hebrews 2, 14 to 18 are so, so precious. And I don't expect this morning that these truths are going to explode in your heart like a confetti cannon but I hope and pray that they will settle there like a small seed taking root in good soil. I hope and pray that they will grow and bear fruit watered by the Holy Spirit of God so that when death comes calling for someone that you love or for you yourself, I pray that you'll be ready to rest in the shade of these glorious realities. Let me read our passage this morning, Hebrews 2, 14 to 18. 
This is God's word for us today, Life Church. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Church, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I do ask um, that the truth of this word would be like seed sown in our hearts, and I pray that you, by your spirit, would be the wise and capable and faithful gardener of our souls that you would enrich this seed that is planted in us, that you would cause it to grow. Father, help us today to have eyes to see the glorious hope that is here, perhaps even for the very first time. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In his true humanity, Jesus Christ has destroyed the power and satisfied the penalty of death. That is the sermon in a sentence this morning. In his true humanity, Jesus Christ has destroyed the power and satisfied the penalty of death. Now in two places in the passage, Hebrews shows us the true humanity of Jesus. That's the emphasis here, right? And so let me start by pointing that out to you. He begins in verse 14 when he says, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Christ himself, likewise partook of the same things. So the children he mentions here, those are the spiritual offspring of God. That's not every person on the face of the planet. Those are God's adopted children, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and in his gospel with true and saving faith. The he himself is Jesus. And Hebrews says that because the children share in flesh and blood, because the children are frail and weak and limited and finite and human, because the children are vulnerable to decay and to death, Jesus then partook of those same things for us. The second place the passage emphasizes this is in verse 17. Hebrews says, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Jesus had to be made like us in every respect. That includes our limits and our vulnerabilities, and our frailties. It includes our humanity. And so Hebrews is emphasizing Jesus was fully and truly human. Hebrews has already emphasized prior to this passage that Jesus was truly and fully God, but here he's emphasizing the full and true humanity of Jesus Christ. Now perhaps you think of the humanity of Jesus the way that we think about the humanity of Superman, where we recognize that the Superman sort of looked like a man and talked like a man, but he wasn't really a man. And we know that because he came from a different planet, and then anytime he got into like a real pickle, anytime he was really struggling to sort out whatever evil Lex Luthor was trying to hoist upon the world, then all Superman had to do was like go into his phone booth and change his clothes, and all of a sudden who he truly was was revealed for all to see, and he could solve whatever problem he needed to solve. Or perhaps you think of the humanity of Jesus like Jesus is playing a video game but with the cheat codes 
And so whenever there's something that he needs to get out of, a boss he needs to conquer, right, he just punches in the codes and suddenly he's not really human anymore and he can just do whatever he wants. But that's not the Jesus we meet in Scripture. Yes, Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully human. And it's important to note this, right, when he's walking around on the earth and still today, he is always fully human. Right, so there are not some moments when he can shift into divine mode and out of human mode. No, he's always fully human. And so there's never a moment when Jesus was not like his brothers in every respect. And there's never a moment when he did not partake in flesh and blood, which means the hardest and most challenging things about being human were hard and challenging for Jesus. Like us, he was subjected to sickness and to sorrow. Like us, he was lonely when his friends and his family rejected him and abandoned him. Like us, he wept when his closest friend died. He was tempted and he was tried like us. He grieved over the consequences of sin and death and the world like us. And he faced those consequences himself. In his full humanity, Jesus really and truly went to the grave. And he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. The beating of his own human heart slowed to nothing. The blood stopped flowing through his arteries and through his veins. His lungs exhaled, and then he inhaled no more. He was wrapped in a towel. He was laid in a tomb because the God-man, Jesus Christ, he was really and truly dead. But, and this is the point of our passage, the true death of the fully human Jesus, it accomplished two things for his people. For his people, the fully human death of Jesus satisfied the penalty of death. That's what we're gonna see in verse 17. And then, the fully human death of Jesus destroyed the power of death. That's what we're gonna see in verses 14 and 15. So, verse 17 It's all about the penalty of death versus 14 and 15. It's all about the power of death. And we're going to go in that order, even though it's backwards, and that's going to really bother some of you. In his true humanity, Jesus has satisfied the penalty of death. Look at verse 17. Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect. In other words, he had to. So if he wasn't made like his brothers, if he wasn't fully human, he couldn't do what he had to do. Why is that true? Well, because he came so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, I looked this week... Apparently, it's worth knowing, there are roughly 800,000 words in the English language. Now, linguists, they say that most of us, we get by with only about 2,000 of those 800,000 words. And so that means that most of us were leaving 798,000 words on the shelf, ready to be dusted off whenever we need them. In case you're curious... These are the 10 most frequently used English words. Are, the, of, and, to, in, that, is, I, it. Now I tell you all of that because propitiation is not one of the 10 most frequently used English words. And it is probably not in the 2,000 words you use on a regular basis. It's not a word that you read on social media in all likelihood. It's not a word that you hear on a podcast or on talk radio. It's not a word that you hear even in many sermons, which is unfortunate. Because propitiation might be the most important word in the universe. One of the reasons we don't use the word propitiation much is because we can't understand propitiation without talking about God's wrath. And frankly, we generally don't like talking about God's wrath. In fact, 
I imagine as you were planning to be here this morning, as you were setting out your Easter outfit and your family's Easter outfits, as you picked out the perfect Easter bonnet, as you made plans for whatever you're gonna do after this, as you thought about your Easter celebration, I'm, I'm gonna guess that, that God's wrath was not at the forefront of your mind as you were thinking about that. Now to propitiate, it means to satisfy or appease God's wrath. And when Hebrews says that the fully human Jesus became a merciful and faithful high priest to make propitiation for the sins of his people, He means that Jesus, in his priestly death, has satisfied God's wrath against our sin. But to think about God's wrath that really blows up the ways most of us want to think about God. It's kind of jarring even to hear the word amidst our Easter celebration. Most of us want to think about a God who's loving, benevolent, and kind. And the God of the Bible is those things 100% for sure. But he is not merely those things. Because any being that is truly loving and benevolent and kind must then also be holy and just and righteous. Which means he must have wrath against those who transgress his holiness and his justice, and his righteousness. We see love and wrath, they're necessary consequences of one another. You actually can't have one without the other. You can't have a God who is loving without also having a God who will exact righteous vengeance against those who harm the people he loves. I always illustrate that this way. Like, I have a daughter, she is lovely, I am wrapped around her little finger. She knows it. I know it. Basically, anything she wants, she bats her blue eyes, and I give it to her if it is possible for me to give it to her. Her brothers, frankly, I could take or leave them, right? But (laughs) my daughter, she is the apple of my eye. I would never write her out of the will, right? Even if she said something disparaging about my preaching, right? I would do anything for her. And let me tell you this. Because of my love for her, do you know what I would do? to you if you harmed her, right? This is a necessary consequence of my love for her. I'll I'll just tell you, right? Like, I'm not a particularly strong man. I'm not fast. I'm not athletic. I don't own a firearm. I've never trained in, like, hand-to-hand combat in any way. But if you were to harm my daughter whom I love, Like, I would rip you limb from limb. I don't know how I would do it. I'd have to, like, do some research on the internet probably to figure out how to make that happen. But that would be be an implication of my love for my only daughter, right? Because, Because wrath is a necessary consequence of love, which means that it's because God is purely and perfectly loving that he is also a God who will exact his righteous and just wrath against sinners. This is why it was necessary. This is why Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Because someone had to make propitiation for sinners. Someone had to appease and to satisfy the wrath of God against sinners. And the truth at the very core of what we celebrate at Easter and every day of the year as followers of Jesus is the fact that Jesus put himself forward to be that appeasement. He is the one who has satisfied the wrath of God by standing in the place of sinners like me and like you. In his humanity, he became our merciful and faithful high priest. He stood between a holy God and an unholy people. And just as the high priest would offer sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people in the Old Testament, right? Jesus offered himself to atone for the sins of his people. His blood was the proof of his death, the proof that he had satisfied the wrath of God, not against his sin, because he was without sin. His death and his blood were the proof that he had satisfied the wrath of God against our sin, if we have trusted him in true faith. And I have prayed that you would see the beauty of that today. I have prayed 
that the Lord would open your eyes and your heart to behold how glorious that truth is because it is that truth that distinguishes this thing that we're doing here from every other way of life in the world, right? In every human religion, right, it's the worshipers who make the sacrifices, where it's the worshipers who come to God and they recognize that they are under judgment from God or that they need to appease God or they need to do something to placate the anger of God. It's the worshipers who come and they say, God, here's my sacrifice. Take this sacrifice so that I can turn away your wrath from me. But Christianity is altogether different than that because the gospel says that God didn't wait for us to bring a sacrifice to him. He offered himself as that sacrifice. He said, take the blood of my son to accomplish what you could never do for yourself. Because, friends, we could never, ever make propitiation for ourselves. But the son has. And by making propitiation, he has satisfied the penalty of death. Why do I call it the penalty of death? Well, because from the very beginning, death was the penalty of sin. But by the work of the son, that penalty is no more. Christ's people may die, yes, but death does not have the last word. Christ's sacrifice for sin was accepted. And so Jesus rose from the grave. Atonement was made, and so he rose from the grave. And if we are in him, we shall too. Jesus has satisfied the penalty of death for those who trust him in true faith. And we can see then how Jesus also destroyed the power of death. He did that by overcoming Satan, the one who would wield death's penalty against us like a weapon. Look at verse 14. Jesus, he's shared in flesh and blood. Why? That through death, his death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Now, what does it mean that Satan possessed the power of death? And in what way has Jesus destroyed that power and the one who wields it? I think it helps to think about this question. What is the most lethal weapon in Satan's arsenal against you? I want you to think about that for a minute. What's the most lethal weapon in Satan's arsenal against you? Like if Satan had one shot and only one shot to take to try to knock you out, what is the weapon that he would choose? Now, the Bible calls Satan the prince of darkness, suggests that he commands the armies of darkness, and that he is capable of unleashing the forces of hell against you and against me. And friends, that's sobering, but that is not Satan's most potent weapon. And perhaps Satan could do something to you like what he did in the Old Testament to Job, Right, Satan killed Job's flocks and herds. He killed Job's children. He afflicted Job with a miserable illness so that Job had like boils all over his body and he just sat in the dust in his misery. And Satan did all of that to Job to prove a point. Maybe he could do that to you. Maybe he could make your circumstances in life a living hell that still would not be his most deadly weapon. And maybe Satan could... Send demons to possess you, right? Maybe he could turn your life into some kind of raunchy horror flick where your eyes roll into the back of your head and your head spins like 360 degrees around completely and they have to like summon a priest and you know that guy's gonna die, right? Because that's what happens every time in the horror flick. Maybe that could happen to you. But still, it would not be Satan's deadliest weapon against you. Now, Satan's deadliest weapon against you It's your sin. His most deadly, his most powerful weapon is the weapon of accusation. 
the accusation that he can make against you before a holy and righteous God. See, he knows that God is full of wrath, and he is eager to use God's wrath against you. Right? He's eager for the day when he can appeal to the wrath of God against you. That's why death is so fearful, by the way. That's why death is so terrifying. Hebrews says that we're enslaved to the fear of death. Why is death fearful and terrifying? Well, it's not just because it's sad. It's not just because it means the end of like everything that we love about life in this world. It's not just because dying at age 17 is way too young to die and we mourn and grieve over that. No, death is fearful because it's when death comes that judgment follows. Death is fearful because that's the moment when you stand before the holy and righteous and just judge of the universe. And Satan's greatest weapon against us will come in that moment. But what we've already seen in verse 17 is that Jesus has paid the full penalty that our sin demanded. He's made propitiation, which means he's disarmed Satan. He's robbed him of his most potent and his most powerful weapon. Satan's attack against God's people, it's not over, right? I mean, Hebrews says that Satan's been defeated, and he has, right? Final victory is certain. Jesus has won it through his resurrection from the grave on behalf of his people, But Satan is still fighting. However, what propitiation means, the reason propitiation is the most incredible word in the universe is because everything Satan does from this point forward is just his last gasp effort. It's the last stand of a defeated and vanquished foe. And so his attacks against God's people, they're toothless. Yes, he still commands an army, but the charge of his army will break against Christ's propitiating work like waves break against a cliff. Yes, he can still fire arrows, but his arrows will bounce off Christ's propitiating armor like marbles bouncing off of a sidewalk because Jesus has destroyed the power of death by satisfying the penalty of death. He hasn't just destroyed the power of death. He's destroyed Satan in his full humanity. He propitiated our sin. Satan's only hope is done. He's destroyed the power of death and he's satisfied the penalty of death forever. That's the good news this morning. Now in the years that I've been a pastor. I have become far more comfortable around death and around the dying than, frankly, I ever expected to be. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll go so far as to say that I've come to, in a way, really appreciate the ministry that happens around death, the ministry that happens around dying. I mean, as a pastor, I get to be with people in some of the most joyful and sweet moments of their lives, weddings in particular, right? I'm a part of a lot of weddings, and I love being a part of weddings. But the honest truth is that I would choose to be part of 10 funerals for every wedding. Because when you're a part of a funeral, when you're with people and present with people in their last moments, right, like all all pretense is stripped away, and the priorities get crystal, crystal clear. Like we understand what's really, what life is really about and everything else just kind of fades into the background. In other words, like people know in that moment that life is a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And that's when real truth can be pressed into people's lives. And so I've come to really appreciate and, and even love funerals. Now, I've served other churches before the Lord called me here and in those other churches, um, funerals have sometimes been a weekly reality. Here at Life Church, I think it's because of the age of our church and then because of the age of most of the people in our church. Um, funerals are far rarer. When they happen among us, they tend to be tragic, but they just don't happen very often. 
And I sometimes wonder if one of the consequences of that is that we as a people miss the gravity and the perspective that frequent encounters with death kind of force upon you. And I wonder if one result of that is that the person and work of Jesus is maybe just a little bit less precious to us because death is a little bit less real to us. See, we can easily forget that the order of life is a mirage. We can easily forget that this idea that we will inevitably go from crawling to walking to running, right, that's a myth because life is a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes. You know, one of the follies of youth, one of the follies of a people who are mostly young is that we can so easily believe the lie that we will live forever or at least as long as we expect to live, as long as we hope to live. Which means we can go through life without leaning on the one who has made an end to the penalty and the power of death. We can go through life without a relationship with him, not even realize that we need that relationship. We can go through life disconnected from his people and not even realize that that is a problem. We can assume, just let me live my life now. I'll deal with Jesus later. What folly when life is a vapor, a mist that appears and then vanishes? Friend, I ask you, what hope do you have that will endure the moment after you breathe your last breath? What hope do you have that will endure the moment after the blood stops coursing through your arteries and your veins? What hope do you have that will endure the moment after you are laid in a grave? I hope, I pray that you've trusted in Jesus Christ. And if you have, I pray that the person and work of Jesus will become to you a sure and steady hope, a beacon that brings you home even amidst the fiercest storms that this life can throw at you, even in the midst of death. There's an old story about the American Presbyterian minister, Donald Gray Barnhouse. Um, Barnhouse was an incredible Bible teacher from a couple generations ago, and for about 40 years, he pastored the very famous 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, just a great man and a great pastor. When his three children were still young, um, Barnhouse's wife and the mother of his children, she tragically died. And apparently Barnhouse like really struggled in that moment to know how to like shepherd his grieving children when he was still grieving himself. And the story goes that like he was in the car with his kids one day. They were actually on their way to the cemetery, on their way to like the funeral services and the burial of his wife, of the mother of his children. And like the struggle was just like really bearing down on the great pastor we stopped at a stop sign or a stoplight or something, and, and a truck pulled up next to them, a large truck. It was the middle of the day. And this large truck, it cast a long shadow over Barnhouse and the people in his car, and he felt it, and his children felt it. And the man thought, that's it. And he turned to his children in the car. He said, tell me, would you rather get hit by that truck or by the shadow of that truck? And his children intelligently said, we'd rather be hit by the shadow of that truck. And Barnhouse replied, that's right. And that's the way it is with death for a Christian. Jesus was hit by death. He was fully and truly human. He was like his brothers in every respect. And he was hit by death as he made propitiation for our sins. But Jesus was hit by death so that we would only be hit by the shadow of death. Church, I hope you know, that is our sure confidence and our strong hope. 
I pray that you would find joy in these things on this Resurrection Sunday and every day. Pray with me.